As the sun cast its final glow over the horizon, Rowan and Lauren were caught in a tension that thickened the air. The room seemed smaller somehow, confined by the weight of their choices and the pending nightfall. Rowan moved to the window and closed the curtains, sh shutting out the dying light. We can't just sit here, Rowan broke the quietude. We need to face her, Loren. She's causing havoc and it has to stop. I know, Loren said, his face lined with worry. The question is how. She's elusive and she's clearly dangerous. Rowan looked at the newspaper clippings scattered on the table. The sketched face of the mysterious woman stared back, her eyes seemingly following her every move. I have an idea, but you're not going to like it. She's been calling out to you in your dreams, right? Maybe you should go to her, just like she wants. You mean, use me as bait? Lauren's eyes widened, filling with a combination of fear and disbelief that Rowan knew about his dream. It's here in your journal, you idiot. Rowan laughed a bit, pointing at the dreams Lauren had written down. It might be our best shot, Rowan replied. Her voice tinged with urgency. You said she spoke to you in your dreams, told you to meet her alone in the forest hills. Loren hesitated, then nodded. She did. In the dream, she was in the clearing, dancing in the rain, her eyes glowing that dark shade of crimson. She said she wanted to see me there alone. Rowan's gaze met Loren's, an interplay of fear and determination reflecting in their eyes. Then we know where we have to go. I'll be nearby, hidden. If anything goes wrong, I'll intervene. After a moment that stretched on for what felt like an eternity, Lauren agreed. All right, let's do it. Under the haunting light of the moon, Lauren stood alone in the clearing of the forest hills. The atmosphere was thick with suspense, as if the night itself held its breath. He remembered her voice, the soft, whispering tone that had infiltrated his dreams. You came, Lauren. He turned to see her stepping out from the forest shadows, an ethereal figure in the dim light, her eyes glowing an otherworldly crimson. Why? He managed to ask, his voice tinged with both curiosity and dread. Why not? She replied, her lips curving into a sinister smile. At that moment, Lauren felt a shift in the air, a presence approaching, its energy disrupting the night's natural equilibrium. It was Rowan closing in from her hiding place. The woman's eyes narrowed, as if sensing the change. You're not alone, she hissed. Time seemed to freeze. As Lauren looked at the mysterious woman and sensed Rowan's presence nearby, he knew that they were all bound by invisible ties. Ties of blood, destiny, and dark secrets. Whether those ties would serve as chains or as a means to liberate them was a question hanging precariously in the balance. And so, there they were. Three souls locked in a complex dance, each holding a piece of the other's fate, the outcome undecided and laden with dark possibilities. The atmosphere was electrifying, tension hanging palpably in the air as Lauren locked eyes with the enigmatic woman standing before him. I'm done playing your games, Lauren said, his voice tinged with both anger and desperation. Why did you do this to me? To Rowan? What do you want from us? Oh, the curiosity in you is truly tantalizing. The woman replied, her gaze dancing flirtatiously across Lauren's face. Enough evasion, Lauren snapped, feeling his patience fraying at the edges. Who are you? The woman's lips curled into a mysterious smile. Very well, since you're so insistent. You may call me Vona. Rowan, appearing from the shadows, couldn't hold back any longer. Vona, is that your name? What kind of sick game is this? Vona chuckled. Oh, Rowan, you have no idea how amusing this is for me. But games aside, I think it's time for some introductions. Suddenly, the atmosphere shifted. Emerging from the surrounding darkness came a group of enigmatic figures, their eyes glowing an ethereal shade of crimson, a coven of vampires. Vona gestured toward them elegantly. Meet my family, she announced. Lorraine's gaze darted between the vampires and back to Vona family. Is this what you've turned us into? Just another part of your twisted family? Vonna simply grinned. Well, every family has its secrets. The gravity of the situation closed in around Lauren and Rowan as they stood back to back, encircled by the tightening noose of vampires. Whatever blood ties and destinies bound them were being tested in this critical moment, 
and the choices they made now would reverberate through dark, unknown avenues of their future. The air hung heavy with another worldly energy as Loren and Rowan remained encircled by Vonna's coven. Even as he stood there, Loren could sense a conflicting pull. One, the dark magnetism of Vona's presence, and the other, Rowan's familiar essence that now felt like the only tether to his humanity. You see, Loran, you've only scratched the surface of what you're capable of. Vona began, her voice a seductive whisper that drifted through the night air. Join us and embrace the power that flows through your veins. I made you. Don't you want to know why? Loren's eyes darted over to Rowan momentarily, then back to Vona. Is that what this is? Some kind of initiation? Joyce, Thona corrected him, gesturing theatrically to the moonlit world around them. An invitation to a life unbound by mortal restrictions. A life of real freedom, real power. Silence settled over the group. Each member of the Coven watched them intently, eyes glowing a fiery red that mirrored Vona's own. Rowan tightened her grip on Loren's hand, sensing the sway Vona's words might be having. Loren, you don't have to listen to her. We can figure this out on our own. Vona laughed, a chilling sound that resonated like a dark melody. Oh, Rowan, still clinging to your quaint notions of love and fidelity. That's all so human. Loren felt his resolve wavering. Her words wormed their way into the recesses of his mind, illuminating long-suppressed desires for power and freedom. Could he truly turn his back on the prospect of realizing the full extent of his newfound abilities? Was clinging to his past with Rowan holding him back? Rowan looked into his eyes, sensing his inner conflict. Loren, please remember what we had, what we still have. Don't let her take that away from us. The weight of their shared history, the love and the tragedy, suddenly came rushing back to him. Loren knew that taking Vona's hand would be more than a physical act. It would be an irrevocable step into a world of moral darkness from which there would be no return. Locked in this critical juncture, his decision now would irrevocably shape not just his destiny but Rowan's as well. A choice between the mysterious allure of limitless power with Vona and the fraught but familiar human connection he had with Rowan, both beckoned with an intoxicating allure. But he knew that once made, the choice would echo in the chambers of his eternity. I won't join you, Vona. Lauren finally declared, letting each word slice through the tension. I've seen the path you're offering, and it's not for me. Bonner's expression hardened, her crimson eyes glowing even brighter with a sudden flare of anger. You would dare refuse me, Lauren. After all, I gave you this life. I could just as easily take it away. And what? Kill me? Lauren spat, locking eyes with her. Maybe that would be a mercy compared to the life you're offering. Rowan felt a mixture of relief and trepidation, holding her breath as the air became charged with a volatile energy. Oh, you misunderstand, darling. Vona cooed, suddenly lunging at Lauren. A speed was inhuman, covering the distance between them in a blur. Before anyone could react, she'd sunk her fangs deep into Lauren's neck. Rowan screamed, breaking free from her paralysis to lunge at Vona, but two members of the coven restrained her effortlessly. Vona withdrew her fangs and immediately slit her own wrist, forcing her dark, potent blood into Lauren's mouth. Drink, Lauren. Feel your true nature awaken. Lauren's body convulsed as he ingested Vona's blood, his eyes rolling back in his head. The energy around them seemed to pulsate, as if resonating with the dark ritual Vona had enacted. Vona's blood was more potent than human blood because of how ancient she is as a vampire and because of that her blood was like a drug and a virus. She intended to make Lauren's blood lust grow stronger, and that is exactly what her blood is capable of. He could never escape her because she is his maker. After what felt like an eternity but was only seconds, Verna released him, letting him stumble back. Rowan was released too, rushing to Lauren's side. He looked disoriented but alive, his eyes meeting Rowan's with a confusion that spoke volumes. Verna laughed a sound that echoed like a chorus of demons in the night. The more you feed, the stronger the new part of you will become. One day you'll be like us whether you like it or not. For the first time, Lorenon felt a trace of fear ripple through him. The enormity of what Vona had done, the irreversible transformation she had catalyzed, settled over him like a shroud. Even if he never joined her, he would now always carry a part of her within him. 
a monstrous part that threatened to eclipse the man he once was and the man he wanted to be. Rowan tightened her grip on Lauren's hand as if she could hold him together, her own mind racing with a myriad of emotions she couldn't yet articulate. Loren turned away from Vona, his eyes meeting Rowan's. In that moment, despite the darkness that clouded their path, something in Loren crystallized. He may carry a part of Vona within him, but he also carried his history, his choices, and his love for Rowan. And he would fight to protect that, come what may. Let's go, Rowan, he said softly, taking a step back from the coven, pulling Rowan with him. Vona and her coven didn't move to stop them. Run all you want, she called out. Her voice tinged with a malice that promised their paths would cross again. You can't escape what you are, Lauren. And when you're ready to admit that, I'll be waiting. As Lauren and Rowan retreated into the shadows, away from Vona and her coven, they felt the weight of the decisions that lay ahead. But for now, they had each other, and as flawed and complicated as their love was, it was theirs, and it was real. In a night shrouded by uncertainty and dark revelations, Lauren and Rowan found themselves in a new reality, one where their fates seemed irrevocably linked to forces beyond their understanding. They hurried through the labyrinthine forest, their steps quick but cautious, avoiding the eyes of both mortal and immortal beings. Lauren felt Vona's blood coursing through him with an otherworldly potency, a wildfire consuming his very essence. Yet every glance he stole at Rowan, who held his hand like a lifeline, reminded him of a different fire, one that warmed rather than consumed. Finally, they emerged from the forest and found themselves back at Lauren's secluded home. A sigh of relief escaped Rowan's lips as she closed and locked the door behind them, as if a simple bolt could keep away the darkness that now pursued them. Are you okay? She asked softly, her eyes searching his for signs of the monster Vona had promised would emerge. I don't know, Lauren admitted, feeling like a stranger in his own body. Her blood. It's like a storm inside of me, raging, howling to get out. Rowan looked at him, her eyes filled with both love and a haunting sadness. We'll get through this, Lauren, together. He nodded, unconvinced but wanting to believe her. I have to find a way to resist this, Rowan, to resist her. We will, but you're not alone, Lauren. Remember that. The couple moved to the couch, sitting in a contemplative silence. The air was thick with words unsaid and fears unvoiced, but also a love that, while tested, had not wavered. Lauren's thoughts drifted back to Vona's last words, a haunting refrain that echoed in his mind. Could he truly escape what he had become? Could he ever be free from Vona's malignant influence? More importantly, would his love for Rowan endure the monstrous urges now taking root inside him? What are we gonna do now? Rowan finally broke the silence. We need to find out more about Vona and her coven, Lauren said, his eyes filled with a steely resolve. Understand what they're planning and find a way to reverse what she did to me. Rowan nodded, squeezing his hand as a new determination settled over them. They were in uncharted waters, true, but they were there together. We have a long night ahead of us, Lauren added, standing up and moving towards his study, where texts on law, arcane rituals, and unspeakable darkness awaited him. Rowan watched him go, her heart aching but her spirit unbroken. In Lauren she saw a man besieged by forces both internal and external, but she also saw her love, her partner, the man with whom she was willing to face any darkness, no matter how all-encompassing. And so they entered a new chapter, one filled with challenges and dangers unlike any they had faced. Lauren delved into research with an almost obsessive focus, while Rowan took to her new life with a courage she hadn't known she possessed. As they navigated this dark maze, two things were clear. The night was long, the dawn was far from guaranteed. Yet despite this, neither of them would face it alone. Why didn't Vonna show any interest in me? Rowan finally asked, her voice tinged with a complex brew of relief and indignation. Loren sighed, the lines on his face deepening as he contemplated how best to explain. Rowan, it's a flawed and antiquated system that I didn't make, but um, unfortunately, a part of. When I changed you, it marked you as under my dominion, in their eyes. It's a code of conduct, twisted as it may be, designed to minimize conflict within our kind. Rowan frowned. So it's like an unspoken law, to keep some semblance of peace. Exactly, Lauren nodded. 
By these rules, Vona or any other vampire can't harm you or take you from me without breaking that law, which would invite retribution not just from me, but from the larger community. They can't violate it without facing serious consequences. Rowan looked at Lauren, her eyes narrowing as he explained the vampire hierarchy. So let me get this straight. She began cautiously, in this world you've pulled me into, I'm considered your property. Is that it? Lorraine sighed deeply, the weight of centuries, old traditions bearing down on him. It's an archaic system, Rowan. One, like I said before, I don't agree with. But it's how Vona and those like her operate. They see the world in terms of dominions, spheres of influence, if you will. You were changed by me, which in their eyes puts you under my protection or control. She interrupted, her voice tinged with bitterness. Loren shook his head. It's not about control, not for me. For them, it's a way of maintaining in order, minimizing chaos. If everyone went around turning and claiming humans willy-nilly, it'd be a bloodbath, literally. So it's a code, Rowan said, mulling over his words. A code to keep you all from tearing each other apart. But what does that mean for us, for you and me? Loren leaned in closer, his eyes locked onto hers. It means that according to their rules, you're in my domain. They can't harm you without inviting reprisal from me. It's less about ownership and more about a bizarre form of respect among creatures who are anything but respectful by human standards. Rowan sat back, her eyes searching Lawrence. And what does it mean that you're hers? As you said, is that why she's so obsessed with finding you? So Lorenz's gaze darkened. Yes, it seems so. In her eyes, I'm a part of her dominion, a subject who has gone rogue. No matter where we go, she'll always consider me hers to reclaim. Rowan felt her stomach churn at the thought. The woman, Vorna, was a constant shadow looming over them, threatening to shatter whatever semblance of normalcy they could muster in this new life. So we run, she stated, more as an acceptance of their reality than a question. Loren nodded. We run, but we also prepare. She won't stop, and neither can we. Their eyes met, and in that moment an unspoken pact was forged. They would navigate this tangled web of ancient codes and modern love together, come what may. Rowan's eyes darkened, her mind racing. This meant they were perpetually chained to a cycle of running and hiding, their lives bound by the whims of a sadistic creature from Lauren's past. Then what do we do? She questioned a sense of urgency creeping into her tone. If she won't stop coming for us, if this bond is unbreakable, what's our way out? Loren leaned forward, clasping her hands in his. We may be bound by these archaic laws, Rowan, but we're not helpless. We'll figure it out, one way or another. We have to. In that moment, Rowan felt a strange amalgam of despair and hope. Despair at the invisible chains that tied them to a relentless pursuer, and hope emanating from the unspoken bond that was forming between her and Lauren. Have you ever considered? Joining Vona's coven, just to gather information on how we might break free. Rowan's voice wavered slightly as she presented the audacious idea to Lauren. Lauren stared at her in disbelief. You want me to join them? Rowan, we're talking about malevolent creatures. You're no different, Lauren. She interrupted, locking eyes with him. Your predatory nature knows no bounds. You've only been a vampire for a few years, and look at you. You're already halfway like them. The accusation hung heavy in the air. Loren looked stricken. Is that how you see me? As just another monster? Rowan sighed, her eyes softening. No, not a monster. But we're caught in a dangerous world, Loren. You and I both know that Vonara and her kind are a threat we can't ignore. So why not turn the tables? Lorenz's gaze hardened, his voice tinged with bitterness. You want me to submit to her, to give her the satisfaction of adding me to her twisted family? Rowan shook her head. Not submit, spy. Gather enough information to know how we can break these chains once and for all. She thinks you're a rogue element. Let her believe she's reining you in while you're actually figuring out how to break free. Lorenz seemed to ponder this, the weight of the decision heavy on his face. It's a perilous game you're proposing, Rowan. It could cost us everything. Rowan met his eyes squarely. But it could also give us our lives back, couldn't it? If we know their weaknesses, their codes, we could use that against them. Loren sighed deeply. 
If I do this, if I walk into that lion's den, you understand there's no turning back. The stakes are life and death, and not just our lives. We'd be gambling with our souls. I understand, Rowan said, her voice laced with a mix of trepidation and resolve. But what other choice do we have? Loren looked at her for a long, fraught moment. Finally, he spoke. I never thought I'd be considering something so insane. But you may have a point. Sometimes to beat the devil, you have to venture into hell. Their eyes met, a wordless pact solidifying between them. Loren would play the spy, the Trojan horse within the coven, while Rowan would hold the fort, preparing for whatever contingencies their dangerous gamble might necessitate. And as they sat there, staring into the abyss that their lives had become, they both realized they were willing to risk it all for the slim chance of reclaiming their freedom. Before you go, there's something else, Lauren began, his eyes meeting Rowan's. I found someone online who could be useful to us. His name is Dr. Gareth Fields. He's based in Montana and is heavily into the lore and research of vampirism. The guy has dedicated his life to studying vampire mythology and history. Rowan's eyes narrowed thoughtfully. What makes him so special? There are many people obsessed with vampire lore. But he's different, Loren insisted. He's an academic and his research is extensive. He studied ancient texts, delved into archives, and even conducted interviews with people who claim to have had encounters. So, you want me to go meet him? Rowan queried, cautiously optimistic. It's a bit of a journey, but if it's for valuable information, then it could be worth it. Exactly, Loren nodded. I'm going to gather what I can from within the coven. But having external intel could be vital for us. You can go under the guise of academic interest. Say you're a student or a writer researching vampire folklore. Keep your true identity hidden. Rowan paused, the significance of the mission sinking in. All right, I'll go to Montana. I'll find out what this Dr. Fields knows. Be careful, Rowan, Lauren said, his eyes intense. We can't be certain who we can trust. At that moment, Rowan's phone buzzed on the table, pulling her out of the intense conversation. She glanced at the caller ID. It was work. All right, baby, I'll have to go to work. I'll be back when I get off, and we can finalize our plans. Loren leaned in and kissed her, his lips lingering longer than usual. Take care, Rowan. Remember, we're treading dangerous waters. She looked into his eyes and saw a complicated mix of love and apprehension, a mirror of her own emotions. I will, Loren. I love you. I love you too, he whispered, watching her grab her coat and head for the door. As it closed behind her, a wave of trepidation washed over him. They were venturing onto a path riddled with uncertainty and peril. Loren sat alone in the dimly lit living room, his gaze fixed on the door through which Rowan had just left. His body tensed, each muscle fiber contracting involuntarily as he felt the blood of Vona continue to pulse through his veins. It was like fire, a different kind of burn than he'd ever felt. With each second, the sensation intensified, as though daring him to break, to yield to the infernal influence it carried. But he resisted, reminding himself of the pact he and Rowan had just forged. They would navigate this deadly labyrinth together, whatever it took. Clenching his fists, he pushed the corrosive sensation to the back of his mind. But its presence remained, dormant but indelible, a constant reminder of the intricate web they were now ensnared in. Meanwhile, Rowan pushed open the heavy doors of the funeral home, stepping into a situation that looked like a set from a horror film. The reception area was swamped with officers and distraught family members, the atmosphere thick with an amalgam of grief and unease. She could immediately sense that something was drastically wrong. She didn't need her enhanced senses to feel the tension. It hung in the air like a heavy fog. Rowan! Thank God you're here, the director, Mr. Franklin, nearly shouted as he rushed toward her, his face flushed and eyes wide with what could only be described as sheer panic. I've never seen anything like this. It's a disaster. Calm down, Mr. Franklin. What's happened? Rowan inquired, although a part of her already suspected the grim answer. It's the attacks, Rowan. They've escalated. The city's in a state of emergency. We've received dozens of bodies tonight alone, and it's not even midnight yet. Rowan felt her stomach sink at his words. She had hoped that the escalation in violence was isolated to her and Lauren's experience, an anomaly in the grand scheme of things. But this was something far worse. 
Any leads on who or what is behind the attacks? Sir Franklin shook his head, his gaze dropping to the floor. No one knows, or if they do, they aren't sharing that information with us. The bodies, they're drained, Rowan. Completely drained. Just like the others, but there are so many more. The thoughts immediately flew to Loran Vona, and the dark underworld they were now a part of. Could this be the work of Vona's coven? Or perhaps another faction of vampires making a brazen power move? The implications were dire, either way. All right, she said, snapping back to the immediate crisis. I'll get started on the embalming process right away. The sooner we deal with this, the better. As quick as you can, Rowan. And please, be careful, Mr. Carl Franklin added. His voice tinged with a foreboding that sent chills down her spine. As Rowan donned her protective gear and prepared to enter the embalming room, she couldn't shake the disquiet that enveloped her. Was this the new reality? A world teetering on the brink, with death lurking around every corner? She thought of Loren, alone his home, grappling with his own internal turmoil. They were both ensnared in a growing storm, one that promised to leave nothing untouched. Ruin stepped into the embalming room, her eyes scanning the array of lifeless bodies laid out on the stainless steel tables. The stark overhead lights bathed the room in a sterile glow, but it did nothing to diminish the heaviness that filled the air, a smog of despair and dread. She pulled on her latex gloves, a new sensation, began to invade her consciousness, an insidious, gnawing hunger, not the sort that a human would feel, but something far deeper, a primal urge that whispered to the darkest corners of her being. She'd been so consumed with worry, so focused on navigating this new terrain of monsters and mayhem, that she had neglected the most basic of her new needs. She needed to feed. Rowan hesitated, her hands hovering over the embalming instruments. Her eyes flickered to the bodies, then quickly away. The thought was abhorrent, unthinkable, but the urge was there. A shadow lurking at the edges of her mind, refusing to be ignored. She gritted her teeth, struggling to exert control. This isn't me, she muttered under her breath, but the words sounded hollow even to her own ears. The truth was, she didn't entirely know what me meant anymore. In a bid to distract herself, she began the embalming process, focusing intently on the task at hand. Fluids were drained and chemicals were pumped. All the while, the sensation of hunger loomed larger, a monstrous entity all its own, clawing and tearing at her restraint. She found herself looking at the veins of the bodies, seeing them not as vessels of life once lived, but as pathways of sustenance. Her fangs itched, as if impatient to sink into flesh. She was horrified by her own thoughts, and yet the urge persisted, as insistent as a drumbeat, a primal rhythm that spoke of need and survival. She grabbed her phone and texted Lorraine. Emergency. The hunger is getting bad. What do I do? No sooner had she sent the text than she felt her phone vibrate in her pocket. Lauren's reply was immediate, hold on. Rowan, resist it. I'll bring you what you need. Don't do anything you'll regret. Rowan looked at the screen, her eyes lingering on the word regret. It was a concept that seemed increasingly fluid in this strange new reality. She pocketed the phone and went back to her work, the motions mechanical but precise. Each incision she made was a line drawn between her old life and the thing she was becoming. Each suture seemed to pull her further away from her humanity, each knot tied leaving her more ensnared in this dark existence. She sealed the last stitch, she took a deep, unneeded breath. The body was a bundle of contradictions, still yet restless, dead yet so painfully alive, and that aliveness demanded sustenance, but it would have to wait. For now, she had a job to finish, responsibilities to attend to. For now, she could hold the darkness at bay. But for how long? Rowan leaned against the wall, her eyes flicking to the clock. Each tick seemed to amplify her hunger, twisting it into something that felt increasingly uncontrollable. Her phone vibrated again, Lauren's name flashing on the screen. I'm on my way. Just a bit longer. Hold on. His words were meant to be comforting, but they only served as a stark reminder of the dilemma she found herself in. How did one hold on when every fiber of their being screamed for something as fundamental as sustenance? It was then that the door swung open and another gurney was wheeled in. This one by Dale, one of the assistants. New arrival, he said. 
briefly making eye contact before hastily exiting the room, as if sensing that something was off but not wanting to know what. The body was that of a middle-aged man, recently deceased, still clothed in a hospital gown. Uncharacteristically, this body hadn't been drained of its fluids. Rowan felt her resolve waver, her hunger zeroing in on the fresh supply. Her eyes darkened, her fangs elongating of their own accord. For a moment she stood there, caught in a moral deadlock. Her human side fought valiantly, reminding her of ethics of the person she once was, of the lines that should not be crossed. But the vampire in her was far less sentimental. It spoke in the language of need, of survival. Before she knew it, she was beside the gurney, her fangs sinking effortlessly into the man's neck. The taste was intoxicating, a flood of life coursing through her, invigorating and empowering. She drank deeply, each gulp erasing a bit of her discomfort, her hunger finally being sated after what felt like an eternity. Finally, after draining the body completely, she took a step back, her eyes refocusing. It was as if she had been in a trance, the weight of what she had just done sinking in. Panic rose within her, followed closely by shame, but before she could fully grapple with these emotions, the door swung open. It was Mr. Mike Franklin, the second funeral director. Rowan, I heard you were back. I was so backed up. I was hoping to go over some... What are you doing? Rowan's eyes snapped up, meeting his. She'd missed seconds to come up with an explanation to cover what she had just done. I was just about to begin the embalming process, she said, gesturing to the instruments neatly laid out on the adjacent table. Mike looked at her, then at the lifeless body, its neck oddly marred but well hidden under the collar of the hospital gown. All right, he said finally, his tone tinged with relief, as if grateful to delegate responsibility. I've got a ton of paperwork to catch up on. Don't stay too long. You've been putting in too many hours as it is. Of course, Rowan replied, her voice steady despite the adrenaline coursing through her. As the door closed behind him, she slumped against the table, a wave of conflicting emotions washing over her. The immediate problem had been averted, the hunger momentarily sated, but at what cost? She had crossed the line, a serious one, and as she stood there contemplating the ramifications, her phone vibrated again. It was another text from Lauren. I'm here, where are you? Rowan stared at the message, the words blurring before her eyes. She had just been given a glaring demonstration of how perilous her control was, of how easily it could be undone by basic, primal urges. She was dancing on a knife edge, and the fall, she realized, could be catastrophic. Rowan felt the air shift as Lauren quietly entered through the back door into the embalming room. Their eyes met, and for a second, the gravity of everything that had just transpired seemed to pause. A calm within the storm. What is happening here? Lauren asked, his eyes scanning the array of gurneys with bodies covered in white sheets. Why are there so many bodies? Wow, what's going on? Multiple attacks around the city, Rowan explained, trying to hide her guilt, her inner turmoil. The hospitals are overflowing, and we're the closest funeral home. They're sending them all here. Lorraine's face darkened, and Vona is likely behind it all. She's escalating, trying to draw me out. Rowan's eyes narrowed, her concern overtaking her internal struggles for a moment. Which is precisely why you shouldn't have left your place, Lauren. It's not safe for you, especially after whatever Vona did to you. As she spoke, Lauren suddenly became aware of a myriad of sounds infiltrating the room. Sounds that human ears could not perceive. The rhythmic beating of hearts. Each one a distinct cadence, the rustle of papers, the murmured conversations. But these weren't just any sounds. They were like beacons calling to something deep within him. Something that had been there since the night he was turned, but had lain dormant, suppressed by his constant struggle for control. Now it surged forward, fanned by the potency of Vona's blood that still coursed through him. It was as if a barrier had broken, and the predator within him, always present but contained, was unleashed an ancient animalistic instinct that knew no morals. No boundaries, only the primal urge to hunt and to feed. I, I have to go, Lauren stammered, his voice tinged with an urgency Rowan had not heard before. I'm sorry, Rowan, but I can't stay. Without waiting for her response, Lauren turned, almost stumbling in his haste, and exited through the same door he'd come in, 
As he stepped outside, his eyes met those of a news crew member who was in the midst of setting up a camera, clearly preparing for a live feed about the recent spate of attacks. Hey, you can't be here. The newsman protested, but his words were cut short as Loren lunged at him. Within seconds, the man's screams were muffled, his lifeblood flowing into Loren. It was quick, brutally so, a predator claiming its prey. His crewmates turned just in time to witness the horror. Their faces a mix of shock and disbelief. But before they could even react, Loren was upon them, a blur of speed and savagery. One by one, they fell their life forces consumed in a frenzied feast that left Lauren standing amidst a gruesome tableau. As the last heart ceased its beating, Lauren felt a momentary satiation, the gnawing hunger momentarily silenced. But even as he stood there, regaining his senses, the weight of what he'd just done, the lives he'd just taken began to settle in. He had crossed a line, a point of no return, further deepening the chasm between the man he once was and the creature he had become. His phone buzzed, a message from Rowan lighting up the screen. Where are you? Are you okay? Lauren stared at the words, each one a piercing reminder of the world he was rapidly leaving behind. In this moment, surrounded by the darkness he had just wrought, he felt more distant from Rowan, from humanity, than he had ever felt before. Lauren's finger hovered over the screen, hesitating to reply to Rowan's message. Before he could make a decision, he heard the sound of boots on gravel, heavy and purposeful. He looked up to see the sheriff stepping out of the funeral home, hand already reaching for the holster at his side. Their eyes met. The sheriff's face twisted in a mix of shock and recognition before settling into a hardened resolve. The next few moments unfolded like a nightmarish ballot. The sheriff drew his gun, shouting, Loren, freeze, you're covered in. His sentence was cut off by the sound of gunfire, bullets ripping through the air. Lauren, propelled by reflexes that were now heightened beyond human capabilities, darted out of the way, each bullet missing him by mere inches. At that moment, the back door of the funeral home burst open. Rowan, having heard the gunshots, appeared in the doorway, her eyes widening in disbelief at the scene before her. Lauren covered in blood, the sheriff firing at him, the bodies of the news crew strewn about. The world seemed to slow down each millisecond stretching into an eternity as Rowan's heart. The sheriff's eyes darted to Rowan, only for a moment but long enough for Loran to close the distance between them in a blur. With a swift movement, Loran disarmed him, the gun clattering uselessly to the ground. You should have stayed inside, Loran growled, his eyes flaring red, but then he caught Rowan's gaze and something shifted within him. It was as if her presence, her eyes meeting his, pulled him back from a precipice he was about to plunge over. The sheriff used the momentary pause to scramble back towards the funeral home, shouting, get inside, Rowan. Rowan was frozen, torn between the man she cared about and the gruesome reality unfolding before her. The realization that Lauren had been shot at, that he was drenched in unknown blood, that something was terribly wrong, filled her with a dread she couldn't put into words. Her phone buzzed again, an incoming call from the funeral home director, but she ignored it, her attention wholly consumed by the crisis unfolding before her. Loren looked at her one last time, his eyes searching hers for something, forgiveness, understanding, love, finding no answers but only deepening questions. He turned and disappeared into the night, leaving Rowan standing there, her heart torn apart by sadness in her chest, her world unraveling thread by thread. The screeching tires of another car broke through the stillness, and a second sheriff's vehicle roared onto the scene. The deputy jumped out, gun already drawn and without a moment's hesitation, pulled the trigger. This time, the bullet found its mark, lodging into Loren's shoulder with a sickening thud. Loren let out a guttural roar, pain and anger flaring through him. His eyes met the deputies, and before the man could fire another round, Loren lunged, his speed and power leaving no room for reaction. In a blur of motion, he slammed the deputy against the car, his hand closing around the man's throat. Stop! Rowan's scream cut through the air, piercing the violent fog clouding Lauren's mind. He looked back at her, the conflicting emotions in her eyes mirroring the chaos within him. Releasing the deputy, Lauren sprinted into the woods, his form disappearing among the shadows of towering trees and thick underbrush, leaving Rowan in a scene of horrific violence behind. 
The back door of the funeral home burst open again as the director rushed out, panting and red-faced. Rowan, why the hell didn't you answer my call? Do you have any idea what's going? Shut up, Rowan snapped, silencing him instantly. Her eyes remained locked on the dark expanse of the forest where Lauren had vanished. Just shut up. The director's eyes widened in disbelief, following Rowan's gaze. Oh my God, he murmured. Was that Lauren? I just saw the news feed. They were doing a live coverage on the rise of local crime and then he got him Rowan. He was on live TV slaughtering those people. Rowan felt as though she had been slammed into a wall. Her world was falling apart piece by piece and she was powerless to stop it. How many people saw it? Thousands, maybe more by now. The director said his voice tinged with a fear Rowan had never heard before. It's already going viral, Rowan. His face, his actions, they're everywhere. Lauren was exposed, but by some twisted fortune, she wasn't. It was a cold comfort, a grim realization that the man she cared for had become public enemy number one. His secret life laid bare for the world to see, while she was still shrouded in the deceitful safety of her own hidden nature.